this uh, this talk, just a few words in advance. This talk will be recorded and will be made available online later. Um, we'll be taking care that uh, only the speakers are recorded. You might be audible if you uh, speak up, but um, otherwise you're not. And um, if you do not agree to the recording, uh, you are kindly asked to leave. Okay. Um, well, anyway, it is my great pleasure today to announce uh, this talk by Martin Ziegler from KAIST in South Korea. So KAIST is the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. There he's a professor at the School of Computing for Theoretical Computer Science. He did his PhD in, in Germany, in fact, in, uh, at the University of Paderborn under the supervision of Rita Meyer of der Heide. Uh, did his habilitation in Paderborn, was for some time in Darmstadt, and is now since a couple of years in Korea. And as you have uh, seen, he will talk today about the computer science of continuous data. And um, well, the stage is yours, Martin. Thank you. So, gonna spotlight me. Right. Yes, thank you very much for this invitation and opportunity to promote what I believe to be a huge blind spot in computer science. I mean, computer science, as we know, um, has been a tremendous facilitator and a catalyst uh, underlying all the current uh, uh, ubiquitous technology uh, ranging from uh, high performance computing to uh, smartphones. But uh, the emphasis has for all this time really been mostly on uh, computer science for discrete data. And actually computer science for discrete data has been also a, a major source of fueling the advance of discrete mathematics. So there was kind of, there is still a very close uh, uh, symbiosis going on here, uh, computer science and discrete uh, mathematics. But uh, through all this uh, success story, uh, I, I want to convince you that um, the realm of continuous data has been neglected by computer science and has resulted in a numerics kind of be, uh, having developed uh, without the support of computer science. And that uh, is gradually uh, leading to uh, a glass ceiling that needs to be broken. And uh, to break, to open this glass ceiling, I think uh, computer science for continuous data is the key enabler here. So, <clears throat> Yes, computer science for continuous data. And as you will notice throughout the talk, <clears throat> uh, the flavor computer science co for continuous data will be heavily uh, logical flavor. And there are many people who are actually working um, to promote and to advance computer science for continuous data. And uh, you see here, can you see the slide? There's uh, some of these people. Um, and, uh, oh, I cannot. Okay, uh, you cannot see my mouse pointer, right? Yeah, but that, that's, I think that's not a serious problem. Right. So, yes, many people um, uh, in, in Germany, in Europe, in, in Korea, and in Japan, um, uh, many of them come from the computable analysis community, but as I'm going to emphasize, computable analysis has uh, long failed to uh, make the uh, claimed step towards practice. And now we're finally in the position to put uh, all the uh, work of body of research and computable analysis into practice and by means of uh, many more developments uh, computer science for continuous data. So um, what's about logic in computer science? Uh, um, so when I started to, to, to work or rather, let's be honest, play with computers uh, as a high school student, I would just sit down and start coding. 
coding uh, programs for, let's say, computing Mandelbrot set, and then run that program maybe overnight. And my friend uh, would maybe be a better coder and uh, would only take uh, half a night for his implementation of Mandelbrot set. And then we would compare and see that both our pictures uh, look the same. And thus uh, we were convinced that uh, these were correct uh, programs and also uh, that his program was faster than mine. But uh, as uh, <coughs> computers began to grow, both in terms of uh, uh, performance and in terms of size like memory, um, this uh, uh, coding approach to computing uh, started to hit its limitation, started to hit some ceiling. And uh, that's where logic computer science really started to kick in with formal approaches to software development that started with problem specification. This is uh, often neglected. Uh, my students here uh, often don't see really the point in specifying a problem, but when later there's some uh, disagreement or ambiguity about the problem specification, then uh, all the trouble starts. So let's start with problem specification, then investigating computability of the problem to be solved algorithmically um, that uh, dates back to Turing, Kleene, and in terms of uh, continuous data, for example, uh, Klaus Weihrauch and uh, currently Vasco Bratka is a leading figure here. Then once computability has been established, one can uh, then start uh, looking, asking about efficient solutions that uh, leads to the uh, area of com computational complexity theory that uh, was initiated by Yuri Hartmanis, then famous uh, Stephen Cook, and currently, for example, in the continuous realm, Mark Braverman at Princeton. Uh, then one can start uh, implementing only then um, and uh, putting the uh, abstract algorithm into some practice. Uh, and uh, with an explicit programming language that leads to the question of programming semantics and uh, formal verification of correctness. Uh, here are some um, leading names are uh, um, uh, Dana Scott and Tony Hoare and, uh, for example, Alex Simpson in the continuous uh, realm. And uh, abstract data types are a major concept or tool that uh, facilitates uh, large-scale uh, software endeavors, breaking down the overall problem into separate uh, parts that can then be uh, dealt with in, uh, independently in groups. Um, and uh, abstract data types are kind of the computer science counterpart to what in logic, in model theory, is uh, called a, a, a structure. Um, I'm going to explain that in more detail. And only then when uh, the people can really start, sit down and put all these things into uh, practice by implementing them, collecting that as a, uh, as a library of these abstract data types and uh, perform all these steps. Um, right, I'm not saying this is always necessary, but uh, um, depending on the size of the software endeavor, uh, um, some of these uh, steps can be skipped. But in general, um, for large scale, it's really uh, important to be aware of all of them. And as I said, this is a, a state of the art in discrete problems, discrete computing, computing of integers, computing over graphs, computing over strings, that's all classical and well established. But when we uh, move into the realm of continuous data, first step is to uh, investigate the setting of real numbers, real functions, real operators. And there um, we hit the first obstacle because often not even the concepts are really uh, ready or very uh, available. Um, so as I emphasized, yes, uh, computability was already investigated by Turing. Computability of real numbers is famous 1936 work. Then computational complexity was pushed, for example, by the textbook of Kerry Cole and uh, Mark Braverman. But uh, regarding uh, formal verification, that's really the first uh, uh, indication of the blind spot. 
And uh, uh, even further, when we talk about um, continuous data beyond real numbers function operators, other continuous structures such as like, for example, um, L2 functions in the Hilbert space or Sobolev spaces or other abstract metric spaces, then we don't even have the definitions for computational complexity. Uh, we have finally, after decades of research in computable analysis, the definitions for computability, but they turn out to be uh, not uh, uh, to be very uh, not robust with respect to complexity. And without a definition, we cannot even start to ask the question. But the question, of course, is uh, is imminent. For example, uh, what is the computational complexity of solving some uh, ordinary or even some partial differential equation where the solution naturally live in some Sobolev space without having a notion of computational complexity, that question uh, remains or waits to be made rigorous. And that's one of the things uh, we're working on. So here, the blind spot indicated by this red arrow starts even lower. And as uh, Doran Seilberger pointed out, a good glamour is worth 1,000 theorems, but a good definition in turn is worth 1,000 lemmas, and without the definition, you cannot even start uh, this uh, very important investigations. And for example, uh, people in numerics have been wondering for decades whether their methods are, are optimal for solving partial differential equations. And that's a realm of complexity theory that can should be able to answer it, but without definition, uh, one cannot uh, even start to make statements, not to mention prove them. So after this uh, motivation, uh, and by the way, please uh, feel free to interrupt me at any time with, with questions. I'm happy to take questions uh, during the talk, but please bear in mind that uh, then you will be uh, uh, part of the recording, uh, but that should not stop you. So anyway, here's the overview of the talk. Uh, I've ju just started and will continue motivating the state of the art and its deficiencies in uh, computer science for continuous data. Then we'll uh, uh, proceed to look at computable continuous data types, where it turns out that already computability is far less obvious than in the discrete setting, where it, uh, most of the time uh, can just be uh, taken for granted. And we'll look at uh, uh, how to uh, do imperative programming with analytic data where there's some kind of limit, yeah, transcendental numbers, for example, and formal verification. Uh, we'll uh, talk about bit complexity theory of differential equations, ordinary and partial differential equations. Um, that leads us to the study of coding theory of metric spaces. Uh, and the emphasis is here on uh, non-discrete, non-finite uh, metric spaces. And uh, yeah, if time permits, and no, probably not, but uh, anyway, um, this, uh, the topic is here. Uh, random sampling of continuous data. There's some big uh, open questions lurking there. And finally, higher type complexity theory. And maybe I'll mention some current uh, um, <clears throat> programs of dissemin uh, dissemination. Right. So. Um, Yes, uh, keeping in mind the time. Yeah, let me keep a watch on my watch here. Okay. Um, right. So, yeah, that's that's a huge uh, um, uh, research program, and uh, everybody is more than welcome to join this endeavor. It's it's far too large for for a single. Uh, uh, person and you already saw it's actually many people uh, working on various of these aspects so I'm more here to to um, how to say to advertise this program than to uh, to post <coughs> um, uh, my results that's not the purpose of my presentation here and uh, yeah just uh, to start with the motivation state of the art uh, if and its deficiencies uh, on the next slide. But first, let me uh, uh, emphasize some of the uh, group members that I 
um, had on the first slide and which areas they are working on. So for example, Dong Song Sun, Ono Poli, Hyunwoo Lee, computable continuous data types. Uh, anyway, yeah, that's just name dropping. Uh, yeah, maybe uh, let me skip over that more quickly. Um, and uh, yeah, jump right into the motivation part. And uh, to this end, let me emphasize the uh, difference and discrepancy between hardware data types and mathematical data types. And to uh, make the point to illustrate that, um, maybe you know Sid Meier's Game of Civilization. And when that game, game came out, I was uh, just in uh, high school uh, uh, at that time, and uh, uh, we would all play that game at home. And uh, to remind you at this, this uh, game has a first kind of rudimentary uh, artificial intelligence, namely all countries that are not led by the human player are instead led by some uh, robot, some artificial intelligence game player in the computer. And that uh, player is uh, characterized with some parameters. For example, Gandhi, the ruler of India, is uh, described with a, uh, one of the parameters is the aggression level. And for him, the aggression level is as low as it can get uh, one. Um, and other uh, leaders have other higher aggression levels and thus uh, behave more aggressively when ruling their game. And uh, one of the rules of this civilization is that when a country towards its development adopts democracy, then its level of aggression decreases by two. So here's an instruction for that, decrease by two. Now what happens when India eventually during such a gameplay develops a democracy? Well, then Gandhi's level of aggression uh, decreases from one by two to what? What will be the result of this uh, uh, decrease one by two? Minus one. Very good, minus one. You're the mathematician, exactly. That's what the programmers had in mind, but the programmers forgot that uh, at that time, uh, um, memory was scarce, so they would uh, use a byte to implement that uh, parameter aggression. And when you uh, take a byte and subtract two from one, then the result is 255. Right, there's a wraparound, there's a discrepancy between the mathematical data type that was in the uh, mind of the programmers and the actual hardware data type, um, uh, they differ. And that led, led to this uh, uh, um, uh, famous computer bug, namely that uh, uh, during the gameplay, usually uh, Gandhi would start to wage war against its neighbors, which is kind of paradoxical and funny. And this is uh, still nowadays kind of a, a running a gag uh, in this game of uh, civilization. But the underlying reason, the underlying cause is the discrepancy between mathematical data types, which we are all accustomed to, and the hardware data types. And for nowadays, I mean, this is long uh, past, but nowadays, of course, modern programming languages really support mathematical integers and uh, uh, building on hardware by it still, but hiding information, hiding object-oriented programming, providing actual mathematical integers without wraparound effects, for example, in, in Java or in, in Python. And if your, uh, your favorite programming language does not support that, then uh, please feel free to use, for example, the GNU multi-precision library um, that provides the same functionality. So hardware data type byte or word still has wraparound as opposed to mathematical integers. And uh, to recall the steps for a rigorous software uh, development from starting from specification via algorithm design and analysis as opposed to programming, uh, then proof of optimality complexity theory, then uh, <clears throat> design and build axiomatic abstract data types, which is a counterpart to lot of structure and model theory in object-oriented high-level programming language, 
where the aspect of semantic comes into play, then formal verification, uh, and only finally implementation. And uh, that's state of the art, as I said, in discrete uh, data processing. But when we talk about continuous data, for example, real numbers, then we're back in the, uh, I'm going to say, Middle Ages in the 1985, when the IEEE standard was introduced, which was a huge progress at that time, standardizing floating point numbers. But this is 35 years ago. And still nowadays, this data type hardware data type dominates the thinking of numerical programmers. Although it differs from real numbers in the same way that bytes differ from mathematical integers, float and double precision floating point numbers differ from real numbers. And that causes a lot of problems. And I'm going to argue unnecessary problems. What we need is a new level of abstraction. Similarly, uh, uh, actual mathematical data type, real numbers, similar to the mathematical data type integers provided already in modern programming language. And I'm going to argue that this is actually uh, feasible. Many people in Numerex don't uh, believe it's feasible, but actually it is. And I'm going to explain how and the consequences how to uh, our programming approach will uh, be modified only slightly in order to deal with that. So uh, further motivation, um, right? Numerics introduction to numerical programming 101 standard, do not test for equality, right? Yeah, everybody learns that, but uh, then the question arises, what kind of tests are allowed if not equality? Can we test for inequality? Well, if we have tests for inequality, then using Boolean connections, one can recover tests for inequality, contradiction. So we don't also have tests for inequality either. So we cannot do anything with real numbers other than uh, process them, right? But uh, nothing else uh, is, you see, uh, yeah, that's a paradox. That's not what, uh, what you would expect. There's some kind of uh, uh, intrinsic uh, inconsistency lurking in the semantics of uh, uh, processing uh, floating point numbers. One of our purposes is to, uh, in this talk, is to uh, really assign a rigorous semantics to uh, tests for inequality of real numbers. And another uh, motivation is a, a specification. So here you see a quote from the numerical algorithms group uh, library uh, about minimizing a given function. So you give a pass a function to this uh, uh, procedure in the library, and it says that normally it will then compute a sequence of x values which tend in the limit to a minimum of f of x, where f is the user function uh, passed to the library. When there are two things that uh, violate the principles of uh, uh, problem specification that I would uh, kind of fail a student of mine if they were to uh, <clears throat> sell that as a specification. I mean, first it says normally. What does it mean to normally compute? And uh, engineers, uh, to be honest, uh, to be fair, uh, get away with uh, saying that in practice. And that's, that's true, to be honest, right? But uh, as uh, scientists, as opposed to engineers, uh, I, we demand a higher level of rigor and we want to really know what it means normally replace that by a formal uh, hypothesis. And the second uh, deficiency here is tent in the limit, uh, meaning there's no rate of convergence uh, promised by the library. So it, it means that the uh, user using that library function, again, cannot really be sure about the quality of approximation of the X value to the actual minimum. And as we'll see, that's not a deficiency for the library, but that's really intrinsic. But uh, still, that uh, serves to uh, illustrate the lack of rigorous specification in nowadays contemporary approach to numerics. Numeric uh, NAG library is still state of the art in uh, many areas. 
floating point numbers IEEE is still state of the arts 35 years after the introduction. And now it's really time, overdue time, to move on to a new level of abstraction where data types and specification and everything are uh, on the same uh, level of abstraction and uh, convenience as has been established for the discrete data uh, decades ago. Right. So here's some example programs that illustrate the issue of uh, uh, um, lack of a rigorous semantics of numer numerical programming that we are fixing, providing a rigorous semantics. So here you see a mathematical uh, recursive definition of a sequence. So uh, first two elements x0 and x1 are given. And then the next element is defined recursively depending on the previous two ones non-linearly, right? So this is a non-linear recurrence. And if you do the math, you see that it will, uh, this sequence converges to six. But if you implement it, for example, in, in, in MATLAB, then and run it, then uh, quite robustly, it converges to 100. So there's not even some evidence that something is going wrong numerically. Numeric very convincingly will tell you, uh, like experimental math will convince you that it uh, solidly converges to 100. And uh, even if you are suspicious and want to try again, maybe with higher precision using the variable precision arithmetic, then still it will convert to 100, just a little bit uh, uh, slower, but still robustly. So that is very deceptive. That's uh, uh, lots of, uh, yeah, uh, all the reliability that we have established in discrete computer science over decades is absent when it comes to discrete data in using contemporary floating point numbers, even with variable precision. At a first example. Second example is about the logistic map, which is a, a kind of dynamic system, again, a recursively defined nonlinear sequence um, with a parameter r. And let's suppose we want to calculate elements of that sequence up to error. So the sequence has values between zero and one. And let's suppose we want to calculate error up to 10%. If we do that in floating point number, we get up to the 30th iteration. Double precision, we get to the 85th uh, uh, iteration, and then only garbage comes out. Uh, if we use long double, new data type, then at least we can get to 200, still, still not further. So one popular idea is uh, how about uh, you replacing floating point numbers with exact rational arithmetic, right? So this uh, iterated sequence maps rational numbers to rational, so we can uh, use uh, uh, explicit uh, representations, numerator and denominator as integers of arbitrary length. In, uh, yeah, uh, double uh, big big integer or uh, GMP GNU multi precision, but uh, it turns out then one cannot even get to 24, not because of lack of precision. The precision is exact, no rounding errors, but because the data size blows up exponentially. Every single uh, iteration doubles the length of the integers, not the value, but the length of the integers of numerator and denominator. And after 24 iterations, it's uh, really out of, uh, out of memory error. Um, and uh, so this uh, is a second illustration of the lack of reliability of contemporary numerical approaches. And this lack of reliability has already resulted in severe uh, disasters. For example, here you see a picture of the Ariane 5 maiden flight, you know, which failed because there was uh, some error in the numerical code that went undetected, but that led the uh, rocket to uh, uh, deviate from its course and finally uh, to crash. And the second example here is the Slave A oil platform, which also was designed using computer aided design with numerical design of the floating tanks. But uh, there was a, uh, again an error in the numerical code undetected that uh, led to an unstable design and 
Now, when the platform was finished building, nobody had noticed this problem, but when it started pulling it out into the sea, it collapsed and fortunately one got, no one got uh, injured, but still it was complete uh, loss of uh, entire oil platform due to uh, lack of uh, to, to numerical problems in the code that went undetected because we don't have in numerics the, the formal methods that have been become standard in discrete computer science. So it's really, uh, uh, really a blind spot of computer science. And that has been observed uh, uh, also in the numerical community. Um, for example, here, uh, Peter Linz from Kura Institute writes, over the years I've assessed on many PhD qualifying exams or dissertation defenses for engineering students whose work involved a significant amount of numerical computing. In one form or another, I invariably ask, how do you know that your answers are as accurate as you claim? That's a good question. Good question, not for an engineer, but good question for a computer scientist and good question for a mathematician. After an initial blank or hostile stare, I usually get an answer like, I tested the method with some simple examples and it worked. Well, that's not very convincing, right, is it? I repeated the computation with several values of n and the results agreed to three decimal places. Now recall this nonlinear recursive uh, sequence previously that uh, kept converging to 100 numerically, but mathematically it converges to six. So that again is not a, a good uh, way of asserting the reliability of a computation. Or more lamely, the answers look like what I expect. Yeah, all lame answers because, what is the underlying reason? Because we don't have computer science for continuous data. Here you see a popular, very popular uh, series of uh, books and uh, CDs uh, containing numerical recipes in all major programming language, but it's called numerical recipes for a reason. It's not called numerical algorithms because what do we expect from an algorithm? We expect uh, specification with respect reliability, correctness, analysis, error, all the things that distinguish computer science from electrical engineering, uh, distinguishes separation that in the past years has been kind of um, become muddy, but really that's boiled on from my perspective to the difference between computer science and electrical engineering. It's the rigor. Now, we have all these great methods for discrete data computer science. Why not just discretize continuous data and then apply the existing method? Why not? Well, the reason has been demonstrated with the examples I already mentioned because um, careless discretization introduces more problems than it solves, right? For example, um, yes, the uh, iterated sequence, discretizing with floating point numbers uh, introduces this. Uh, it's basically due to rounding errors that makes it converge to 100 instead of six. Also floating point numbers violate many of the very nice structural properties that real numbers satisfy. I mean, real numbers have been introduced by mathematicians for a reason, right? Um, <clears throat> 2000 years ago, maybe this uh, <clears throat> Greek um, scientists got drowned for observing that the square root of two is not a rational number. So uh, rational numbers are really not sufficient to deal with mathematics. Sequences of rational numbers, uh, Cauchy sequences maybe, but they are very inconvenient and that why uh, real numbers were introduced as equivalence classes of rational uh, Cauchy sequence because they have all these nice properties that the real numbers do not have. What are the nice properties? For example, um, completeness, right? Also, how about uh, associative and distributive law? You're so used to that, right? But floating point numbers violate associative and distributive laws. 
So if you're writing programs, then you're easy going to end up with the same kind of problem that uh, um, the programmers of the game of civilization had, because they would imagine that there's no wraparound, whereas in hardware there was, same here, uh, associative and distributive laws violated by hardware. Also discretization um, destroys symmetries, right? It breaks symmetries, it introduces uh, artifacts. There's a lot of um, uh, problems uh, introduced by discretization. So in the discrete realm and the continuous realm, I think are two separate realms that have to be kept separately very carefully. And there's a border between the both of them that I want to call Rubicon because crossing that border uh, carelessly can easily uh, lead to a, a fall of a large empire or rather the fall of the uh, Ariane uh, rocket or the fall of the Sleipner oil platform in both ways actually. But my talk is about crossing or not crossing it from continuous to discrete. So in the discrete realm, we have all this uh, number theory, graph theory, everything. In the continuous realm, we have uh, common problems in engineering, like uh, simulating um, uh, behavior of uh, uh, material uh, objects or climate uh, weather prediction. That's all continuous data. Natura non facit saltus, right? Nature does not jump. So everything pertaining to natural sciences naturally involves continuous data. And for discrete data, we have all this progress um, with bits, zero and one reliability. In the continuous realm, uh, there's, for example, analog computers. I'm not going to talk much about analog computers in this uh, talk, but uh, I, I do want to take the opportunity to advertise some recent uh, advances and catching up that is happening in analog computing, that an area that also has been neglected for many decades, and that is now uh, catching up uh, quickly. Uh, and um, quantum computers. Quantum computers, in a sense, are a hybrid between analog and discrete computing in the sense that a quantum bit is uh, not a discrete quantity, not just zero one, but can have any orientation on the, on the uh, complex unit sphere, right? So it's already uh, kind of a, a mix between discrete and continuous. And one common uh, problem that seems to uh, have uh, and maybe still uh, inhibits quantum computers from becoming practical is because they uh, uh, the algorithms that are commonly devised uh, are discrete algorithms and they do not run well on quantum computers. For example, Shor's algorithm for factoring integers, right, uh, has two phases. The first phase is to to set up this uh, this uh, this uh, uh, powering function, and the second phase uh, detects the uh, the period of that uh, uh, power function. Uh, the second phase is what uh, happens in parallel using quantum parallelism. And that's not really the problem in implementing. It turns out it's the first phase, namely uh, raising some integer to some high power modular uh, prime. That can be done efficiently using repeated squaring in the discrete setting. Doing the same repeated squaring in a continuous setting, that is much more difficult. That is where all the um, um, lack of the, the um, coherence uh, gets destroyed. That's where the lack of reliability and the necessity for uh, error correcting codes comes in because uh, a source algorithm is actually a hybrid combination. First phase is naturally performed repeated squaring in the discrete setting and the second phase in the continuous part, but uh, Shor's algorithm carelessly, uh, and most people deem, don't seem to realize that, crosses that Rubicon between the continuous and discrete realm. But my talk is about the other direction that is uh, common in numerics, crossing that Rubicon in the uh, opposite direction by carelessly uh, simply discretizing. It's kind of the 
the the the working uh, um, uh, hammer, right? So uh, if your only uh, tool is a hammer, then every problem looks like a nail. Same here. When your only tool is discretization, then uh, every problem is uh, uh, treated by discretization, and uh, that is a very careful, uh, uh, dangerous approach. Okay, so let's uh, conclude uh, the section on um, uh, motivation, and I've already spent much more time on that, but uh, I think it's worthwhile because it's, it's important really. And as I said, uh, the purpose of my talk is more to advertise this uh, area uh, than to uh, really convey uh, or teach, right? And speaking of teaching, right? You hear this QR code. If you want to take a picture of that, that leads to my YouTube channel, uh, where also this video will end up, where there's an uh, entire lecture series on computer science uh, of continuous data, um, 30 lectures um, all about this. So we can lear learn much more than you ever wanted to know um, about uh, computer science of continuous data. Okay, anyway, moving on, computable continuous data types. Um, right, so what's that about? It's uh, because when we talk about uh, 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 continuous data, then already computability becomes uh, much more uh, uh, um, subtle and uh, often wrong. And then without computability, we cannot even proceed to complexity or other investigations. So um, here's for your convenience, a reminder of the uh, well-established definition of what it means for a real number to be computable, well-established in the sense that it's already been put forward by Alan Turing in his 1936 uh, paper, call a real number computable if it has a decidable binary expansion. That's Turing's definition, basically, um, where the binary expansion um, gives rise to decision problem of such that of natural numbers. Uh, with the question, given n, is the nth the binary digit 0 or 1? Uh, another maybe more numerical uh, candidate definition, yes, as I said, we really uh, are struggling with definitions uh, here at this uh, front of uh, computer science for continuous data. The second candidate definition is uh, there exists a Turing machine that computes a sequence of numerators to dyadic approximations to the real number up to error two to the minus n. I'm going to justify that uh, the choice two to the minus n and uh, numerated denom two to the n in, in a few, few slides later, but let's now just take it there. Imagine this means uh, um, floating point approximation with varying mantissa, mantissa length uh, to n, n bits in order to approximate up to error two to the minus n. So that's kind of a, a formalization of stream computing with increasing approximation. And the third candidate definition is uh, actually due to uh, logician uh, Gregorczyk, you know, Gregorczyk from the uh, Gregorczyk hierarchy, for example, um, um, approximate the real number um, by rational numbers up to given error bounds they tend to zero. And uh, fortunately, we don't have to really choose between these three definitions. This is the same as in discrete computability theory. Do we want to define uh, integer function to be computable if it is computed by a Turing machine? Or do we want to define an integer function to be computable if it is mu recursive, as David Hilbert introduced? And, and uh, um, um, uh, yes, or if it is uh, computable by a wild program, or if it can be expressed in lambda calculus, according to church. Fortunately, all these definitions in the discrete realm are equivalent. And so that also is evidence that they're reasonable. And the same phenomenon actually happens here. Here we have three candidate definitions. They are all reasonable. And fortunately, it turns out that they're equivalent which means we don't really have to pick one. All of them are good and 
all of them are reasonable because there's some uh, uh, robustness, some independence here. A fourth definition is not equivalent, is not reasonable. That is uh, also sometimes implicit in numerical uh, papers, namely uh, just to computing approximations, rational approximations that tend in the limit to the real number without providing rate of convergence or error bound. And recall, this is exactly what the NAG library promises, but uh, this is a, a weaker and a less uh, reasonable definition than the other three equivalent ones, because Ernst Specker proved that uh, this is the same as in providing Oracle access to the halting problem. This is uh, a huge jump in computability theory from, from here to here. So let's discard that one uh, and focus in the sequel on the first two, three ones. And actually, when we talk about complexity later, it's the second that will be our uh, guiding choice. Unfortunately, they're only equivalent computability theoretically, but not uh, complexity theoretically. And the second one, uh, I will argue, is the right choice according to our paradigm that we need good definitions for 1000 lemmas. Okay, so um, moving on, models of real computation. Right, yeah, of course, uh, there's a, a existing body of work and uh, model and uh, algorithms based on this model of real computation. But I want to emphasize that with real, I really mean real numbers, not rational numbers, not algebraic numbers, but uh, including transcendental numbers. So, um, uh, for example, the Leda library uh, supports computing on algebraic numbers, but uh, not in transcendental numbers and therefore is not uh, <coughs> uh, covered or does not answer or cover this question here. And here's a famous major model of computing for real numbers. Uh, the, the Blum Cooker Soup's mail paper, um, which kind of uh, uh, takes the arithmetic operations as primitives and then operates on these imperatively. So it's not a functional, but imperative uh, uh, in agreement with uh, how most of numerical uh, algorithms are developed, imperative. Um, but it has this uh, two deficiencies first. Uh, uh, there's this inequality test, right? Uh, all of these are supposed to be exact, no rounding errors, but this inequality test, as you recall, um, uh, causes discrepancy difference between the actual numerical programming. And we see, we'll see that this is actually intrinsic and not just a matter of floating point arithmetic, but really it's uh, uncomputable. Um, it's uh, equivalent to the holding problem. This is uh, happens to be the same model that also underlies computational geometry. Uh, so that uh, has contributed certainly to its popularity. And also there's this uh, very nice book by Bruno Poisson, Les Petits Caillons, which generalizes this to imperative computing over a structure in the sense of model theory, but the problem one problem is that uh, it has for inequality is unrealistic. And the second problem is that it can only do compute algebraic uh, functions, right? With, with arithmetic operations. In comparison, one can only compute piecewise algebraic functions. So nothing transcendental, no exponential function, for example. At the other uh, end of the spectrum, there's the work of Turing, Kregolczyk, and many others based on Turing machines, computable analysis, with uh, also quite a number of textbooks um, where the ideas uh, to define computability on continuous data by uh, computing on streams of approximations or so every single computation is finite, but uh, with a stream of increasing precision. Um, and this has nice properties. It, for example, here one can compute the exponential function, but not the sine function, whereas the sine function can be computed in the other model and not vice versa. Um, but it's uh, that's the thing. I mean, um, uh, nobody really writes code uh, on a Turing machine, right? So this theory of Turing, Krigolczyk, and Bayer has very nice structural properties, but uh, based being based on Turing machine, 
it never really caught on with numerical people, right? Understandably, I must admit. So there's a there's a veritable uh, gap between both models, between theory and practice. And uh, uh, one particular uh, great approach of bridging that gap was actually the PhD thesis of Martin Escardo and uh, many successor papers. Uh, he introduced real PCF, where PCS is programming with computable functionals due to um, No, okay, I forgot that. Never mind. But the, the point here is this is a functional programming language. As, 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 as much. Yes? Isn't it uh, Milner's work on PCF? Robin right. Milner? Probably, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah, thank you. Right. And Martin Escador extended that from the discrete setting to the real setting, exactly. And it's, it's a functional programming language as, and as much as I love functional programming due to its elegance, again, the numerical community and never really seems to have caught on with that. And it uh, has rarely been implemented. So really the, the, the gap is still here. And uh, what I'm talking about is bridging that gap, but with a similar approach, but an imperative as opposed to Martin's uh, Escardot's work, which is functional. And uh, indeed, that seems to, uh, my students uh, regularly do, do thesis uh, projects, doing imperative programming, and that uh, it takes them some time, um, but uh, they usually uh, get along and then do really actual implementations. I will talk about these implementations uh, if time permits. But the point is really, it seems that the imperative approach uh, seems much more in line with, uh, with thinking, like for example, Gaussian elimination is also an imperative uh, algorithm, not, uh, not in, intrinsically a functional one. Okay, so yeah, more advertisement and time is running out. So um, let me talk about uh, the most basic continuous uh, data type arguably which are the real numbers and uh, we already saw that uh, turning them into uh, continuous abstract data type causes some uh, problems mostly revolving around the comparison predicate right so both computable analysis and the blum swell model agree that the arithmetic operations addition subtraction multiplication division are computable but they disagree on the comparison part. And uh, um, that's what I just uh, see here. The arithmetic operations are computable in the sense of computable analysis, but test for inequality is not. And actually there's a theorem that says it is complete for the halting problem. So it's really something intrinsic and um, uh, don't have the time to formalize that statement, but this is something that does not depend on the coding, not, it's not related to floating point numbers, but it's really intrinsic to uh, real in inequality. So we cannot get around that. And uh, that explains, uh, uh, the, the, uh, justifies the, the numerical um, uh, 101 um, uh, um, gospel, don't test for equality, but now we are in the position to instead provide uh, sound uh, uh, semantics, namely the comparison predicate must be partial. It will return true if uh, a real number is greater zero, it will return false if the real number is smaller than zero, but it will not return ever and at all if the real number happens to be equal to zero. And this partial semantics also resolves the paradox because now we cannot re-express equality as a Boolean combination of uh, inequalities, because uh, when the real number is equal, then the uh, inequality predicate is not defined. Computationally, mathematically, it's very well defined, but computationally, uh, we cannot uh, avoid that. And one way of, uh, of uh, capturing that formally in logic is using cleanest three-valued logic, true and false, and 
unknown but with unknown the subtlety that the value unknown does not get returned when making a comparison. Instead, uh, one can uh, store that value into some uh, data type of type cleany, kind of lazy evaluation, basically not evaluation. And uh, topologically, this is reflected by uh, imposing this cleanish three-valued logic with a Sierpinski topology, where it, uh, which is a non hausdorff topology, where the value true and false can be separated according to the T2 separation axioms, but the value unknown cannot be distinguished uh, topologically, cannot be separated topologically from the other values. So this is a, a new data type in uh, dealing with real numbers, clean is three valued logic, equipped with a, a Sierpinski topology. Okay, moving on. So computable analysis says that if we have a sequence of, uh, uh, of uh, computable functions and that uh, converges fast in the Cauchy sense with respect to suprenum norm, then also the limit is computable. And that will su suggest a formalization of what uh, people in numerics have been doing all the time, basically. Yeah, we do not really do, <laughs> yeah, we make an effort not to do something new, but to provide a rigorous logical foundation to what people in numerics have been doing implicitly, most times successful, except when not successful. And uh, um, yeah, I'll get there at the bottom of the slide, but first I need to introduce an additional operation, which I'm uh, going to call choose, because that's how uh, the existing implementation of this approach due to Norbert Miller uh, has called it. So um, this is an operation that allows to deal with the uh, with the cleanest three-valued logic, which fails to evaluate if the mathematical value turns out to be unknown, then uh, the value cannot be evaluated computationally. Uh, this is just basically postponing, right? Lazy evaluation of the comparison predicate. And uh, how can we then still write total programs if the comparison fails uh, or freezes, uh, if there's an equality? And the choose operation is a way to do that. Uh, the value of the choose operation, so there are two cleany arguments of type cleany, um, if uh, uh, it returns zero, if the first is true, it returns one, if the second is true, and it returns either zero or one, if both are true. But the point is, if the first is true, then it doesn't matter what is the value of the second, it doesn't even get evaluated. If this value of the second is unknown, then still uh, choose is defined computationally. So that's one way of, uh, turning uh, undefined, computational undefinedness into computational definedness. This is kind of a, uh, like an absorption property, um, but it's multi-valued, it's non-extensional. It returns either zero or one. If both are true and they gain, this is unavoidable. One cannot uh, make it uh, computable by saying, if both are true, then I want the value zero to be returned. So again, this is intrinsic uh, for reasons that I don't have the time to get into. And this is a, these are the two things that my student need to get over when uh, starting to write programs in this setting. Uh, first, comparison is now partial. Uh, if two, if the real number X is equal to zero, then the comparison will not terminate. Well, measure theoretically this most of the time, this is a rare condition, but we want not uh, most of the time, but we want correctness always. And the second new thing to learn is uh, to use this choose operation to get around this undefinedness, but in turn uh, deal with this multivaluedness. Uh, if you execute this instruction twice, then may well be that the first time it returns zero and the second time it returns one. You cannot make any assumptions and uh, about consistency of repeated evaluation. So these are the only two uh, changes to be made. Otherwise, everything works like the uh, numerical programmer likes to think, dealing with real numbers as exact entities without errors. Um, 
So I'm going to skip over this conditional, conditional, continuous conditional and uh, due to, yeah, I'm already over time. So I'm also going to skip over multifunctions. Um, yeah, there's a whole theory about multifunction. One important thing to consider here is that there are now two kinds of restrictions of multifunction. One of making the domain smaller, that's a kind of restriction that you all know from your regular function, but also making the values larger. Paradoxical case is kind of a restriction because that makes it easier to compute. Restricting the domain makes it easier to compute because you can reuse the existing algorithm. And just to add the promise that no arguments will be provided outside of the domain and increasing the value. Also, you can reuse the existing algorithm, which will just uh, uh, return values in the smaller uh, um, range than in the increased one. Uh, so this is a generalization of the uh, uh, restriction condition. And again, it's been well known since many decades in computable analysis that uh, multi-functions are unavoidable. Um, for example, uh, the heavy side function is uh, dis discontinuous and uncomputable, but making it uh, uh, um, uh, into a multi-function, it becomes computable. Anyway, so yes. And I do want to, uh, in spite of having already exceeded time, uh, say a little bit about imperative analytic programming, then I'm going to, to wrap up uh, and leave it to you to uh, study my <laughs> 30 uh, um, le uh, online lectures about the, the remaining topics, bit complexity theory, the quantitative coding theory, and many more. Um, right, so here, um, is a piece of example code computing uh, over real numbers um, using these primitive operations that are now finally all have a rigorous and sound semantics, in particular partial semantics of comparison real numbers. And uh, this multi-valued choose operation here as a DRE operation. And uh, uh, yeah, we of course need still need integers, for example, as counters or loop counters or as precision parameters. And uh, uh, so here's the modified uh, red, the modified uh, uh, comparison, partial comparison. And connecting these two structures, there's a, a precision embedding that assigns to integer p, the real number two to the p. And we make an effort to distinguish, uh, to not identify integers uh, as a subset of real numbers, unless in this way, and that has uh, uh, important logical advantages. For example, the resulting structure will turn out to have a decidable first order theory that was uh, demonstrated or easy consequence of, uh, of work of low funding trees. Okay, so uh, yeah, there's a good reason why this is two to the P and not like one over P. And of course, uh, for higher precision, we're going to let P tend to minus infinity, not plus infinity, but to minus infinity to increase uh, the accuracy. Okay. And the paradigm, which again, <clears throat> seems to have been implicit in most numerical programmers' minds is that arguments to a function here are provided as exact. So no rounding errors, no error bounds and the resulting value is approximate. This is, for example, the paradigm implicitly underlying uh, uh, Newton's method, right? Where you take the function and you evaluate the function and uh, uh, in, its, uh, in its naive, in its uh, uh, pure sense, these are supposed or considered to be exact. And then after a certain number of iterations, one achieves an approximation to the root uh, using Newton's uh, method up to error two to the minus n, and the minus n is here the p. So uh, arguments given exactly, return values are approximate, and computable analysis says still you get closer under composition, which seems superficially to be a violation because if you want to process the approximate return value further as argument to the next function, then it's not going to be exact, right? But computable analysis says this can uh, be dealt with by proceeding from a uh, operational to a denotational semantics. 
and it, implementation wise um okay i'm not uh, for right now going to exp explain how to, that can be implemented but it can be according to computable analysis and it has been implemented in the rm c++ library so the first pro example of actual programming is a fuzzy or so-called soft test uh, used to, for example, by GEP in the rigorous development of algorithms for continuous problems. And the semantics here is that uh, if the two numbers X and Y are very close to each other, then comparing them can return either yes or no. Can you say, yes, X is greater than Y, or Y is greater than X both, or permitted answers, that's why it's a relaxation, a fuzzy or soft test with respect to this error parameter n, if x is very close to y up to error two to the minus n. And this can be now recovered and expressed using the below uh, primitives, using the tools primitive, using the partial comparison here, and observe that if you have equality here, mathematical equality here, then this comparison will not return Right, this is the unknown, it will not return, but then this inequality will be uh, strict and therefore return. And that's point of choose uh, this uh, um, um, that when one of the two expressions is defined, then also the entire choose operation is defined. And so, this is one way of dealing with comparison to be partial and uh, still write total programs. Uh, here's another example the trisection method. Uh, this is a generalization of the bisection that uh, is common in numerics, like bisection for looking for root of a given function f here. f here is the given uh, input function, supposed to be continuous, uh, negative at zero, positive at one. So the intermediate value theorem says it must have a root. And we want to approximate that root up to error two to the p, where p is this given precision parameter that you saw here in the bottom. And bisection does not work. Why not? Bisection would test the sign of the function at the middle of the interval. If this middle of the interval happens to be the root, then it will not return a sign because, yeah, that's the whole point of this comparison having become partial, right? So bisection is not a, a total algorithm in this setting, whereas trisection would test the signs at both one third and two third of the interval. And if the underlying function has a unique simple root, then only one of the two tests, at most one of the two tests can fail. At most one of the two uh, arguments can be a root and the other one will not be a root. And therefore with the choose operation uh, result in uh, still a total defined uh, loop. And here you see that loop. Uh, it comp uh, checks the value on, on this one third and two third of the interval. And at most one of the two comparisons can fail because if both fail, then we have double root and the trisection is specified only for functions that have one single uh, simple root. Also observe that there's the same uh, choose operation here now in the while loop that makes sure with the left and right interval bound are sufficiently close, close to two to the, up to error two to the P, because if the intervals bounds have to be, happen to be equal to two to the P, then this comparison, uh, this comparison may fail. Therefore we have two comparisons to make sure that always at least one of the two uh, succeeds and therefore the choose operation always returns a value. Okay, so yeah, I've already over exceeded my time. So let me um, quickly jump uh, um, to the end and wrap up. So here's, right, right. yes. Right, so to summarize, um, I've uh, uh, spent lots of <laughs> time and effort in motivating uh, the necessity, uh, the lack of computer science for continuous data. I've uh, uh, recalled the state of the art, which is mostly discretization and its deficiencies. 
uh, talked about continuous data types and how to make them computable. For example, for the real numbers, as a structure in order to make it computable, we had to change to restrict the semantics of the comparison predicate, make it partial, and instead introduce this choose operation in order to still be able to write total programs um, using integers. Um, uh, you've seen examples of imperative analytic programming Right, so this is a, um, exceeds the algebraic realm because we only need to provide approximation up to error two to the p, not exact. So we can, uh, uh, for example, easily compute exponential function using, for example, your Taylor series approach. Um, I didn't have time to emphasize the benefits to formal verification. Suffice it here, uh, as I said, that this two sorted structure with this precision embedding two to the P uh, results in a decidable uh, first order theory. Therefore, every statement that can be expressed about a program here is either uh, uh, refutable or provable uh, based on uh, Tarski uh, or generalizing Tarski's uh, uh, completeness theorem. So here we have a real uh, rigorous justification that formal verification is always possible. Um, I didn't have time to talk about computational complexity in numerics. There are some very nice characterizations. For example, solving ODEs is in a certain sense P space complete in a rigorous sense. Uh, many partial differential equations are sharp P complete. Um, characterization of uh, discrete complexity classes in terms of uh, numerical problems bridging thus between discrete complexity theory and, and numerics. Uh, quantitative coding theory of metric spaces is, is a, a large uh, uh, topic, right? So, you know, there's a lot of coding theory for discrete data. Uh, then there's a Shannon theory about <clears throat> computing uh, or coding functions as a finite sequence of real numbers, but the real numbers are still continuous. Uh, here we talk really about coding everything over uh, infinite sequence of bits. Um, random sampling of continuous data, I haven't been time to talk about and high type complexity theory, like uh, complexity theory for operators. It's a PhD thesis of Akitoshi written 2010 under supervision of Stephen Cook, but higher types, uh, that's still uh, again a topic where we don't even have the uh, definitions yet. Yes, so thank you very much for your attentions and patience. And if you still want to uh, talk more about or have questions, I'm happy to <clears throat> expand on any uh, more of these uh, subjects. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's let's thank the speaker for the talk.